Well, good afternoon, everyone. Such a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Michael, for your kind introduction. Um, we think it was because you came to our annual convention that we had the largest convention we ever had, uh, with over 14,000 people uh, in Detroit. Uh, it was the largest, over 7,000 collegiate students, uh, 2,000 two college students, 4,000 exhibitors, over 340 uh, companies and universities were speaking there. And I think they were all there to see you. So, so thank you uh, so very much for your kind introduction. I do want to say a quick word to, about Michael uh, Golden, who is, um, uh, he was one of the first executive directors to uh, come to visit me when I was appointed in 2014. And uh, it turns out his office is in his next in a TV office, and in a TV office, uh, uh, within two or three blocks uh, away. And uh, he, in my opinion, I've seen him in multiple settings as an exemplar for executive directors in, in these associations. In fact, I grew my beard uh, as well, just like as he had to as well. So I'm, I'm tracking, although mine is not as white. Um, so I'm. Uh, Really, once again, honored uh, to be a part of this. And I want to talk a little about the um, the National Society of Black Engineers, and then really speak to why diversity matters. Now, let me just say a quick word. Um, as you can tell, I, I used to work for IBM at one point, right? I'm still so stressed. I put the suit on, I said, you got to be kidding me. Blue suit, white shirt, red tie. Um, so it, it's really, I, I really do believe blue, even though I left the IBM in 1991. Um, but one of the things that they did for us is to fail training. Even though I, I was hired as a business engineer, uh, they really did a good job of training us to listen to our customers and listen to our customer needs. And then really providing solutions to meet those pain points, those needs. And so I'm taking that approach in this conversation about diversity and diversity matters. NESI has 61 Board of Corporate Affiliate members. These are each of the, the highest level of, of, of organizations in terms of our partnerships. Lockheed Martin, Northwest London, um, Exxon, Chevron, uh, uh, Shell, et cetera. I mean, multiple industries are involved. And just recently at our convention, I talked about this phenomenon. It was just an off the cuff conversation, but it really resonated. As you heard today from the CEOs, um, and, and many of those who are on the panel, I think senior leadership really gets the idea and the value proposition of diversity. You heard Ron uh, talk about that um, just, just a few minutes. So the value proposition, I'm going to talk to you about the value proposition. Even if they don't get it internally, they get it rhetorically, right? They understand, they, they know the language that's associated with, with diversity. And I think that the incoming employees tend to understand it as well. They're more likely to have a diverse growth, growth experience, growing up experience, whether it's their school, their college and university, their first job, et cetera. More likely to live in communities that are diverse in the inner cities and others uh, as well. So they tend to get it. What I have found is, is the frozen middle of most organizations don't really understand the value of why everyone's talking about the world. It's the faculty members at a university. It's the middle managers at a company. They really don't understand it because oftentimes the pressure from above and the pressure from below says they have to deliver on a set of outcomes and deliverables. And this stuff about diversity is just, it just kind of noise for them. So what I've been trying to do is begin to kind of write and speak about why it matters for that audience, back to my IBM training. Why it matters for that, that frozen middle. Um, to, to make it clear for them that we do that, 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 that it's important. And so we're going to talk, I'm going to talk a little about that, and then shift the gears to talk a little about inclusion. Um, which is another word that people are throwing around and really define it in a kind of creative way based on uh, some of the work that's been done at University of Michigan. And then hopefully if we have time, like just a Q&A, just to answer questions. So NESB, National Society of Black Engineers. We are founded in 1975 by six students from uh, Purdue University. Any Purdue alumni in the room? I tell you, Purdue is holy ground for NESB. 
Um, these six students from the south side of Chicago put out a call to other colleges and universities to send their African American students in the spring of 1975 to West Lafayette because Purdue had turned around what was a 71% dropout rate or attrition rate of engineers, African American engineers, into a 60% graduation rate by 1975. And they really wanted to share the best practices, the wraparound services, the deans, the structures, et cetera. So they put out a call, 34 colleges sent 40 representatives, and that spring they founded what was the Society of Black Engineers became the National Society of Black Engineers as well. Five of the six founders are still living and they're, they're there uh, as well. Um, we were established, as I mentioned, in 1975. We are one of the largest student government societies based in the United States. So if any uh, staff members have any kind of issues or complaints about their board, imagine uh, being governed by a 23-year-old uh, graduate student. That's me. And they're elected every year. And they're amazing, and they're brilliant. In fact, I was a product of this organization. I was elected national chair in 1984, 85. And it's a DNA, I mean, the leadership training is part of our DNA as an organization. As students as young as three, I mean, eight years old are part of our organization, they get a chance to lead. So certainly by the time they graduate and get into industry, they're really prepared. Uh, but we are one of the largest student government, over 24,000 members worldwide. Uh, I'll get into some of the stats. Over 600 chapters worldwide, and these are pre-collegiate, collegiate, and professional chapters. And we have annual conventions as well, regional conferences, professional development conferences, leadership conferences, uh, all around the country. In fact, in other parts of the world, in, in, uh, in Ghana and Western Africa as well. And one of the things that we've been doing, um, anybody hear Simon Sinek's talk start with why? I see a couple of hands. It is one of the most popular TED Talks uh, that have been produced. Um, he makes the argument that inspired organizations, inspired leaders, are not just clear about what they do or how they do it, but why they do it. And he cites uh, Southwest Airlines uh, as an example. The Southwest will never have a sign of seating because their why is very clear about serving the common man or common person. Um, he cite, they cite Apple as a company that's very clear about their why, and Dr. King, who is very clear about their why. And so we kind of went through an exercise as to why Nesby? What, what is important about Nesby? And really, we talk about this. We unlock potential, we cultivate confidence, and we change lives. That's what our why is throughout our organization. So that's just a little kind of ad or commercial about Nesby and who we are. That's a, a kind of a, a graphic that just shows the, the distribution of majors. Of course, mechanical engineering is number one. When I started, computer science was 7%. And so we are seeing a, a huge growth in the number of computer science members in our society. 33% of our members are women. That's, that's 13 percentage points higher than the national average, as we heard this morning. But it's still short of what we want to get to. We want to get to parity uh, in the organization. All right, so this is the problem. This is the engineering problem, right? The National Academies in 2014 announced the 14 grand challenges. Um, these are the, the challenges that we've got to solve as engineers collectively in this room and beyond. Um, things like uh, the energy and, and clean water and, and et cetera. We have to solve these grand challenges. This is a grand challenge as a country that we have not solved. It is the percentage of degrees awarded to the African American, female, Latin American, and uh, Latinx and Native American. So the top slide shows from 1977 the percentage of degrees awarded to women in engineering in the United States, and the bottom, the blue, the percentage of degrees awarded to the combination of what we call underrepresented minorities, those three groups uh, as well. So if anybody follows the, the game of football, uh, one of my favorite coaches, other than the New York Patriots, of course, uh, one of my favorite coaches is, is Andy Reid here in Kansas City. And the favorite quarterback, of course, is Patrick Mahomes. What we are doing as a country is we're leaving Patrick Mahomes on the, on the sideline for a quarter. That's really what we're doing. Because we're not deploying the best talent in this country to solve some of these complex problems. And that's why we're here today. That's why you've asked me to come and say a few words to you, and that's the problem that we have to solve. 
Think about the complexity of the problems that you are solving on a day-to-day -day basis in and, and, and water and transportation and building technology and you name it. We do that. If we apply the same kind of intellect to solving this problem as a country and deal with this as a system, as an engineer, we should see those, those numbers turn around in the next five to 10 years. I know we can do it, and we're working on that, and I'll share with you some of the strategies. So as a result of this, one of the things that I've noticed as a leader is that whenever a leader announced a big, bold goal, like John F. Kennedy uh, in, the, in the early 1960s, the country or the people around that leader rallies around that goal. So in 2014, we announced a big goal, that we would work with colleges and universities to triple the number of black engineers the nations uh, these institutions produce annually by 2025. From 3,500 degrees that were awarded, which is about 3.5% at the time, to 10,000 degrees. And we are really moving forward. Over the last four years, we've seen a 30% increase in the number of degrees awarded to African Americans. So we're near about 4,500 degrees awarded. So we are kind of providing the, 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 the talent into your industry. We're feeding that talent, and we're working at Eight year, at the eight-year-old level and working our way up the pipeline in order to do that. So we're really happy that we're making progress, but we recognize that, that progress, we can't do this alone. We can't do this ourselves. In fact, most of the strategies that we employ look like this, right? The results look like this. I liken this to propping up blockbuster video. We could do more VCRs. We just open up more stores. Oh, I got an idea. Let's move the DVDs. Wow. So you have to get into your car, go rent the DVD, and make sure you return it so that those late charges are not there. That's really what we're doing. And so you'll see kind of incremental change to improve. But many of you have studied uh, uh, Six Sigma. Many of you have studied Deming's work. And he makes the case, I think it's attributed to him, that every system is perfectly designed to get the results it gets. Every system is perfectly designed to do that. So what Don Millard at the National uh, Science Foundation says, if we want to change the results, what do we have to do? We have to change the system. We have to address systems change. And we do this in this room every day. Every week, every month, we do this. Our firms do this every single day. We want to move from Blockbuster to Netflix in the way we deliver education and service, the way we fill this pipeline. And we have to do this because we have a, a retiring workforce that is not being backfilled sufficiently. So, we started four years ago in partnership with the Society of Women Engineers, Society of Hispanic Engineers, uh, Hispanic Professional Engineers, American Indian Science and Engineering Society, a collective impact approach to address that system change that we talked about. Today there are 60 members of this coalition, uh, including 22 engineering societies, 33 universities, and five companies working toward producing this goal of fit, producing 50,000 diverse engineers annually by 2025, a 66% increase. And we're doing this in a structured way. We're saying, if you're already doing something in this area, join with us and share your best practice. They create action network groups that focus on specific areas. One area we're looking at is the community college linkages between two-year and four-year colleges. Since 42% of all African American college students are in community college, that is a target rich environment, as just an example. And then making sure the coalition at large is addressing really systems problems, like in policy and other areas, promoting engineering. And so we're working on that 50K. We're waiting for some funding from the National Science Foundation to continue to expand and catalyze this effort. All right, so all that was a commercial. That was a preview. Um, that was those, those 20 minutes of, of previews that you see when you go to a movie and get your popcorn. Now, the, the main feature, the feature presentation. But I do want to set up the context of what we're doing. So, back to my IBM days, 
Um, they didn't talk about this because there, a lot of people were math averse, right? So we didn't talk about this. But really what they were training us to do was make sure the, the units that we were presenting match the units of the customer, right? So whatever your need is, right? If it's efficiency, it's reducing costs, et cetera, making sure we had a solution accordingly. I call that matching the units. Making sure the units on the left side of the equation match the units on the right side of the equation. Back to that conversation about the frozen middle. What's important to business? Financial returns, revenue, stakeholder value, et cetera, uh, uh, shareholder value, I'm sorry, so retention of employees, et cetera. All those things are important. Can we frame the diversity conversation, the e equity and inclusion conversation, in terms that are valuable? Because in addition to the fact that it is the right thing to do, as we heard today, most people won't do anything unless the perceived benefit is greater than the perceived cost. That's the classic economic argument, cost-benefit analysis, right? If the perceived benefit is greater than the perceived cost, they'll do it, they'll invest in it. But if the perceived cost is greater than the benefit, they're not gonna change. I will not be moved, I will not be moved, right? So we have to kind of frame this in a way that makes it sense for them to see the perceived benefit. So there are a number of, fortunately, there are a number of papers that have come out recently and reports that have come out. A lot of them. Uh, McKinsey, and Intel, the Dahlberg Group, Harvard Business School, and we were quoted, Ron quoted um, uh, Forbes uh, as well. And so I want to share with you a couple of the updates quickly. Um, this is available um, to you. I'm hopefully we can make it available in your app so that you can download and reference it. I have the reference material as well uh, so that you can reference this and make the case. So diversity matters. McKinsey 2014, fantastic study. They looked at 100 and, I'm sorry, 366 public companies. Um, my eyes are challenging. Um, in Canada, United States, United Kingdom, uh, and Latin America. And they looked at the makeup of their board to directors and their senior executive leadership team. And they found out really kind of interesting values. I hit the red button, by the way. By mistake, I apologize. He told me, it's like, this is so obvious. There are just two buttons. There's a green button and a red button. And I hit the red button. Okay. Companies in the top quartile for racial and ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to have financial returns above their respective uh, industry medians. Okay? This is really what, you know, it just looked like as a correlation analysis, a regression analysis, they kind of determined that. And those that are gender diverse are 50% more likely to have a, a positive returns as well compared to their industry norms. And so if you kind of look at the regression, for every 10% increase in racial and ethnic diversity of the senior elective team is associated with earnings uh, EBIT that rise nearly 1%. <coughs> so again, making the case, right? Trying to match the units with diversity with the, the units that are important in business. Beyond just is the right thing to do, this is a strategic imperative. And I think because of in, in, in the work that uh, uh, McKinsey has done and then the Intel has done in 2016 in partnership with Dahlberg Group, they're kind of, and most people are kind of understanding this, uh, this, this, this information. So they looked at 170 tech companies that released their diversity numbers, and they found the Dahlberg Group that, that every incremental percentage point increase in, in diversity is linked to a 3% increase in revenues. And so what they did is they extrapolated out. What if, if the tech industry was in, at parity, right? What if, if, what if there's 12% African American, 15% Hispanic in the tech industry? What would that look like? This is just a thought exercise. Nearly half a trillion dollars in additional revenue in the tech industry. Now, of course, this is an intellectual argument that's not always the case. The, the, the line might be curvilinear, who knows? But it's kind of an interesting argument and a 1.2 to 1.6% increase in our maximum yield of GBP as well. But wait, there's more. So the Boston <laughs> Consulting Group just recently reduced, uh, introduced this great study. And so the first study was 366 companies. The second study was 170 in the tech industry. This was 1,700 companies across the world. Uh, and they looked at they looked at the innovation revenues associated with innovation. In other words, in the past three years, 
How has the company produced additional revenues on new products that they release over that, in that period of time? Here's the results. Companies with above average diversity on their management teams report higher innovation revenues. Those are revenues that were generated over the past three years with new products and services that were introduced by 19 percentage points. And their EBIT was nine percentage points higher. So again, there's this association with this. Now, I probably, I probably had most of you at hello, right? Because when you get it, you're here, you get it, you, you get it. But hopefully this provides you with some more resource to get to that frozen middle and, and make the case for why this is important for your businesses and companies and the university. And there's a whole set of research that looks at universities and why that matters. And each of these diversity items are additive. So if the, if the management team is more women, then they have better results. And they have more from uh, multiple company, countries, they have better results. So the results were additive that they found. Okay. I'm going to move along because this is really the takeaway. Diverse groups are more innovative. And one of the things that I like about this, for those of you at the university, because we try to make the case why diversity matters in research. And, and what Catherine Phillips found is that a, a, a research team is more likely to be cited if they are more diverse. So they come from multiple backgrounds in a research team at a university, probably the case at a, at a company as well. They're more likely, their research is more likely to be cited than those who, that are more homogenous in their, in their thinking. One of my favorite researchers is, is uh, Scott, Trapp, uh, Scott Page at the University of, of Michigan. He's done some phenomenal work, quantitative models looking at diversity. He calls it the diversity bonus. Uh, but the Harvard Business School sort of answers the question, why is this happening? Why does innovation occur? Because when you're in a, an environment where people have differences with a way of thinking, etc., it really forces you to think about the facts and examine the facts. And, and does this make sense rather than um, experiencing what, what um, uh, uh, Chip and, and Dan Heath call confirmation bias? Right? A lot of our efforts are just, our efforts just to prove, to, to, to prove what we already know. We call that confirmation bias. When you have diverse teams, it challenges that confirmation bias and we have better solutions. We process those facts more carefully, and they're more innovative because we avoid pitfalls of that confirmation bias, that confirmation. We actually end up with better products. And I, I reference the New England Patriots. Uh, I know it's a bad, bad phrase here in Kansas City. Um, but if you look at those teams, and you look at the outstanding players, Julian Edelman, who was the, the MVP of the Super Bowl last year, starting as a quarterback. And then he became a wide receiver. And so he understands different <laughs> aspects of the game, brings that, and they're much more innovative in their, in their solutions. All right, so most people say, okay, I get diversity. I get diversity, I believe in diversity of thought. And I do too. I, I, I certainly know that diversity of thought matters, right? Different perspectives. What does Scott Payne say about diversity of thought? He says, yes, innovative ideas come from diversity of thought. He calls it cognitive diversity. And we have better, more difficult problems. We solve those problems. And research success depends on our ability to predict, innovate, evaluate, solve, design, and create. Okay, we, we heard that, that's, that's the case, and that was the case that I just made. But he makes the argument that you really don't have the wide range of diversity, cognitive diversity, until you add this whole notion of identity diversity. That means we bring something. If you have veterans, if you have the, the, uh, the differently able in your environment, different social economic backgrounds, we bring that identity diversity, brings that cognitive diversity, and the widest range that's there in order to deliver on the success that we're all striving for. So you can't just have this cognitive diversity, diversity thought, he makes the argument without identity diversity. So here are the two references that I, I, I kind of quoted. Um, Scott Page's work, the, the, the diversity difference in 2007, and then the diversity bonus in 2017. And the bottom line is people think differently and harder when around identity diversity. 
Okay. Now, second phase of this is diversity is not inclusion. Diversity, in my opinion, is a means to an end. So all this talk about diversity is just a step towards something else. And that something else is in creating an inclusive environment where people could feel like they could bring their whole selves to the set. Now I have to say, and let me just say, because I probably won't be invited to speak next year, so I'll say what I have really need to say. When I walked into the reception last night, I felt really awkward. And here I am, two degrees from MIT, one degree from Harvard, or University of Harvard, um, and, and I've been in all kinds of environments. And it's, it's, it's striking to me as I walk in and say, wow, this has been a long time since I've been in an environment where I see mostly white males, a handful of women, and a handful of people of color. Now, this is not to, as the young people say, to throw shade on NSP, right, at NSPE. But you are, we are here because of this. This is the reality. But I didn't feel like this was an inclusive environment. Just based on the signal. Now when I walked in and started to have conversations, oh yeah, it was different. Because no one kind of ran me out of here, right? In fact, most, most people were out of embracement. Some people even came looking for me, like John Hall, because he knew me from different, different experiences. But nevertheless, it was just this, the, the image that I got when I got here was saying something that I just didn't feel as comfortable. Now, ultimately, I have a microphone in the stage. I feel very comfortable right now. <laughs> <laughs> Robert Sellers at the University of Michigan says this. He says, diversity is being invited to the party. And you've invited me, you've invited others. Most of us invite uh, people of color, veterans, et cetera, to our, our, uh, our state meetings, et cetera. That's the open, and, and thankfully from 1954, 1955, and, and the efforts that the university have done, we've seen a lot of being invited to the party. Equity is everyone gets a dance. Now, Chicago is one of the most diverse cities in the world, but I know often felt that the, the, the Chicago is, is still kind of segregated, right, in certain places, and other cities are too, as well. Equity says everyone gets a dance. What Robert Seller says, inclusion, everyone contributes to the playlist. Now, a year ago, I started to spin. I go to a Y and spin, you know, cycle spin, and sometimes I have to bring my own music, right? <laughs> it just doesn't get me going until I listen to my own music. So a couple of times I talked to the instructor, I said, oh, you know, Michael Jackson, that was great, you know? This guy, please bring it back, you know, et cetera. There's something to be said when you walk into an environment and it becomes familiar to you. Most of us are at the top of our organization and we don't know that that organization has a culture that is shaped by us. And it's kind of like approaching, uh, if, you, if they can talk, approaching goldfish and say, how's the water? And they'll say, what the heck is water? Culture is like that for most of us. We don't understand the norms and the behaviors and the values, et cetera, that are part of that culture because we created it. The temperature is just right for us. But what we're trying to do is create an environment where everybody feels that they can also um, thrive in that setting. Inclusion is that optimal state. That experience where I feel valued and a sense of belonging on your team. I feel value and a sense of belonging. That's really what we're going through. So, our inclusion equation is diversity is just a means to an end. Inclusion is the, is the climate and the culture. And what's the secret sauce, the catalyst that brings the two together? It's meaningful interactions. It's the kind of engagement that occurs beyond just the numbers where people can challenge each other challenge each other's biases, both explicit or implicit. We heard that today. There's been a lot of studies that show that we all have biases. Ohio State University, the Kerwan Institute says, 
that implicit bias is an equal opportunity bias. We all have it. We have biases against and for, and what we need to be thinking about is not to eliminate the biases, although we should, but to recognize when those biases are playing out and move us from what they call system one thinking, which is reflexive, to system two thinking, which is much more conscious. I used to ride motorcycles. I had a Kawasaki 1000cc uh, con concourse, beautiful bike, which I always tell people it woke up. I remember telling my wife this because she's a physician. But it woke up at 80 miles an hour. <laughs> my dad used to ride Harleys. I would never buy a Harley. It's Harley, it's a Harley, right? And some of you are, like, hey, it's okay. Some of my best friends are Harley drivers, right? <laughs> but when I meet someone that says they ride a Harley, the first reaction is, oh, they're that kind of person. <laughs> That's system one thing. System two thinking says they might be an engineer too. <laughs> I'm just using that as an example. But the point is moving from system one to system two thinking. Why is this important? Um, because it's pervasive, it, it, it's not explicit oftentimes, and, and, but they are malleable. So I'm going to come back to this. We all have this preference. And this is Scott Pelham. Brett Pelham has done a lot of work in this area. We all have a preference to choose people who are like us. He called that implicit egotism. He says that we are more likely than by chance to marry someone or to date someone who has the same birthday. We are more likely than by chance, if our last name is Carpenter, for us to become a Carpenter. Or our last name is Doctor for us to become a doctor. Slight preference, he calls that favorable self-associations. <clears throat> so we are more likely to hire someone <coughs> who has a similar background than we have. And what we're trying to do in this conversation is move us from that system one thing into system two. That, wait a minute, if 17% of all engineers, black engineers, graduate from historically black colleges and universities, and we have never been to an HBCU to recruit, then we're losing a significant amount of talent. Because there's a Purdue and Hampton, I mean Purdue and Michigan and MIT, et cetera, because that's where the leadership came from. But changing this perspective and recognizing our own implicit egotism is really what this this talk is all about. And we do that by engineering the environment. So this is the last uh, slide before offering some resources. So what do we do to engineer the environment? What do we do? We assess our own expectation and unconscious bias. There's an, there's an implicit association test by Project Implicit on the website at Harvard University and other at the University of Wisconsin. It allows you to take your implicit test in your comfort of your own home, in the privacy of your own home, or in your office. I've taken it and I realized, wow, I've got these the biases. I discovered that I had a certain biases against African Americans. I mean, I'm, I'll be honest and be frank with you. So I had to kind of check that in me as well. And um, the research finds that we develop racial biases as early as six years old. And until we have the meaningful interactions, those biases persist. Second, be intentional about adding and retaining diverse leadership and diverse uh, leadership in your organization. Um, we heard this today, that it's one thing to get people in the door, but another thing to keep them. And I always say retention is the barometer of your culture and your climate. If you're able to keep people and make sure that they thrive, then it's an indication that you are creating an explosive environment. Next, foster vertical and horizontal meaningful engagement throughout the organization. This is based on my dissertation work and, and which builds on Vincent Tintos, who found that students are more likely to stay in school to the degree to which they have quality relationships vertically with faculty and quality relationships horizontally with their peers. 
That still applies to the workforce. A person will stay in an environment to the degree to which they have quality relationships with management, quality interactions, and quality relationships and connections with their peers. You have an employee who sits by himself or herself and does his or her work, and doesn't interact, and doesn't go to the, the employee cookouts and other things, then you can almost guess, you can almost predict when they'll, they'll leave. Then, educate leadership about identity. Let people understand that people come in with different senses of identity, and identity influences their behavior. Sexual orientation, racial and ethnic. When Paul, um, <coughs> the former president of MIT, just blanked on his name, um, started to do a lot of work around diversity, he actually started to read a lot of a literature that was written by African Americans in the 1960s. James Baldwin, Malcolm X, and others, so that he can understand some of those issues. Um, there are things that are out there that one should be educated on and be familiar with. Tenahasi Codes is one of them. Educate, examine implicit and explicit reward structure. So uh, Robert Bergino, former dean of science at MIT, uh, did a study, actually authorized a study, and found that the female, the women faculty members got smaller labs, smaller salaries, and smaller resources than the men. And that was in the, the late 80s, early 90s. And they published that report, and they changed the whole culture there. So look at your implicit and reward structures. Who's getting promoted? What are the salary structures, et cetera? And let the data speak. Get the emotion out of it and let the data speak in your organization. And finally, Align individual collective motivations and evaluations with the rationale for change. So making sure that you match the units. What's important to the company, what's important to that frozen middle, and making sure you're making the case and communicating in a way that is appealing to them, that's, that's important to uh, those in your organization. So let me just finish up with this. Um, anybody recognize this? One of the most popular songs, I think 14 weeks on the Billboard Hot, uh, Top 100, um, Top 100. This guy dropped out of college, Lil Nas X, dropped out of college in, in 2018 to focus on his music, much to the chagrin of his parents. He released this song, Old Town Road, um, in December of 2018, just last year, a minute and a half long. Immediately, it was so popular that Columbia Records signed him to a, a contract. In April, he partnered with this guy, Billy Ray Cyrus, in April of this year. And they remixed the song, Old Town Road, Most of What We Hear. It moved up the charts immediately. 14 weeks, number one Billboard Top 100. Also, the top song in Australia, New Zealand, <laughs> Germany, France, you name it, all over the world. It introduced a new genre. It's called country rap, a different genre. And I don't know if you saw it, you too, a couple of months ago, Lil Nas X surprised Billy Ray Cyrus with a brand new Maserati. It had success. Bringing together differences together is what really makes innovation, why this matters. And so, in addition to inviting to the party, everyone gets to dance, everyone contributes to the playlist. How do you feel after your experience? How I define belonging. And I know if I feel belonging, then I've got the cognitive surplus to solve those complex problems that you and I have to solve to be engineers. Thank you so very, very much for your time. So you mentioned what the membership was in the NSBE starting in 1975. What has been the change in membership in the last 35 years? That's a, that's a great question. I meant to mention it. We actually saw a 26% year-over-year increase in our membership. Uh, last year, we ended our fiscal year, which is July 31st, at 19,000. We're at 24,000 now. 
Um, the big growth is our new partnerships. Um, part of this 50K initiative was to uh, identify uh, where we can grow and franchise the organization. So we joined with a couple of community-based organizations to establish NISB Junior Chapters. Um, we also established uh, fraternities, sororities. Uh, those are already grassroots in the community uh, to establish and we kind of provide them with a model. New partnerships like uh, Biomedical Engineering Society, BMES, they're developing new curriculum for us. So we've really opened up and said we, we need partners uh, in order to be successful. Other area of growth is in Western Africa. Uh, we have over 50 chapters in Ghana, uh, seven chapters in Nigeria. We just established new chapters in Rwanda, we have Gambia. Um, so we're seeing that growth uh, as well because engineering is everywhere. Um, so um, I, I know that many of our associations are having a problem getting the millennials into our organization. <coughs> we have solved that uh, really by, by listening to them and responding. And we would be happy to, to share some of the strategies that we've employed. It sounds like the emerging leaders, is, is part, emerging engineers, is part of that strategy. Thank you. Carl, let's dig, drill down a little bit deeper. Uh, Tom Roberts. Um, okay. Hey, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, good to see you, Tom. <laughs> you talked about strategies and partners, and we've got these chapters spread all across the United States, and some of them are located in universities where there are also NSBE chapters and the like. Can we drill down on the strategy, get your thoughts on how might we work more collaboratively in those kinds of environments? Yes, you must have read my uh, recent proposals. Uh, um, I, I worked in a university at, at MIT for, for a number of years, and I discovered I was the advisor for the SHIP chapter, Society of Hispanic Professional Connection chapter. But we had an ASCE chapter, we had an IEEE chapter, we had uh, the concrete uh, canoe teams and everything else that was going on. And when you look at those chapters, they tend to be male and uh, white and Asian, right? And not a lot of women. If they're women, they're doing the scribing, right? I mean, that's typically the behavior. So one of the things that we, we are looking to do is create incentive grants for the colleges and universities to foster the kind of meaningful interaction between the diversity societies and the disciplinary societies on campus. So creating these grants to say, do something together to bring these, these things together, these groups together. And um, we are also putting together a proposal that will pull in the disciplinary societies and the diversity society to create a set of inclusive practices. So here's how you can recruit um, diverse talent in your disciplinary societies like NSPD and others. Here's how you can retain them. Be as sensitive, um, teachers are doing this, be sensitive to who's volunteering to do things and what they're doing and make sure you diversify that uh, as well. Um, schools recognize that now that boys are more likely to volunteer um, to answer a question. And so some teachers who are enlightened are saying, well, I'm not, I'm gonna count for two or three seconds before the women raise their hand and call them. So those are the kind of inclusive practices that we're looking to create. Um, so we are, we're submitting a couple of proposals, part of that NSF proposal for the 50K Coalition, and the other is the United Engineering Foundation. As well. well, thank you, Dr. Reed. And one of the things that we've done as a um, society is we do have an alliance that we work with um, National Society of Black Engineers. We're trying to work on the diversity and over my four years on the board of directors, I've come to become friends with Nesby and become a friend of um, Dr. Reed. So thank you for your insights and thank you for being here, Carl. And one thing that friends do is when you share information, you forget that it gets shared with everybody else. And Carl is a very selfless man and he decided to share his birthday with us today and come with us and present on his birthday. So would everybody please help me thank Carl for sharing his birthday with us.